Hi, everyone. Ah, it's our last webinar today for International Coaching Week, week 2018. It's really been amazing partnering with all of you for the entire week. And of course, we're going to go out with a bang. I'm about to introduce to you uh, Professor Peter Hawkins. Now, mm, I'm just not going to be shy about saying this. I'm really a, I just love Dr. P, uh, Professor Hawkins' work. And the first time I heard him was in 2015 at the ICF conference in London. And I honestly sat like this for the entire duration of his talk. I think I even forgot to blink. Just listening to all the value he had to have on his topic. And I had to warn myself today not to do that and go into listening mode, but to also pay attention that I was partnering with him on this webinar. So I, I hold myself accountable to holding that space. I'm not going to introduce Professor Hawkins by giving you a whole lot on his profile because I'm sure you all know about him. What I would say is that, you know, engage with him, partner with your chat or putting your feedback onto the chat box and ask the questions that's burning for you or that you really want some answers for. So really engage with him as a person and with the content so you can take away a lot of value from the session. And without saying anything more, I introduce to you Peter Hawkins. Thank you uh, very much, Cindy, and uh, thank you, Magda, and thank you, Ram, in Bangalore. It's a pleasure to uh, join. I think this is the second year that I have joined uh, this webinar series for the Celebrate Coaching Week around the world. Um, lovely to see so many people on the line from many different parts of the world. I've just come back myself from working last week in Johannesburg, um, and I spent most of April in America and in Canada. And for those of you who were on the last session, I was in uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island with Damien Goldbarg at the All Americas Coaching Conference on Coaching Supervision. And it's lovely to see how coaching supervision has spread around the world in the last 15, 20 years. And, and finally, to see really getting established in South America and North America was a delight. So uh, good morning to all friends in America and Canada. And good afternoon to friends in South Africa and Zimbabwe and other parts of Africa and uh, in Europe. And, and good evening to friends in India and Asia. And uh, for those of you joining from California, thank you for getting up so early. Um, Today I'm going to talk about leadership team coaching and what are some of the new developments. And as part of that, I'm going to talk about what I see as the necessary revolution in coaching. For coaching that's had such a successful period in the last 30 years to be fit for the future. How do we help the coaching profession not just do what it's already brilliant at doing, but how do we help it develop? So it's meeting the new demands of the 21st century. And, and a lot of this I've covered in, in the third edition of my book, Leadership Team Coaching. But I've also drawing upon two years of global research in a research report that I brought out last year for Henley Business School called The uh, Tomorrow's Leadership and the Necessary Revolution in Today's Leadership Development. And we'll talk a little bit about that and I'll draw upon that. But as um, Cindy said, and Magda, please, as we go through any questions you've got, please put them in the chat box and Cindy's gonna be watching them come in and we'll pause a couple of times and deal with questions so that we can keep this very two-way process. So I'd like you to start just by thinking, and perhaps if you've got a paper and pen, to write down, who does your coaching work serve? And write down as many people as you can think of and 
as many systems as you can think of. Who does your coaching work serve? And I guess many of you will have written down clients, individual clients. You might have written down their families. You might have written down the people, the clients are responsible for leading. You might have written down the customers of the clients, the internal customers, the external customers, their organization the investors in the organization, the communities in which the organization operates. I, uh, the time before last, I was in South Africa, I did a hall talk on corporate activism. Uh, and I had the honor of being on stage with Praveen Gordon, the ex-finance minister who blew the, uh, the whistle on the previous president there. And that was a whole evening about how do businesses take more responsibility for the, the, the social and political changes in the areas where they operate. So we might think about those communities. We might think, well, our work also serves, how do we make people more conscious of their ecological responsibility? But also, I think coaching also serves the future stakeholders of our clients. How do we not just help them be better at today's job, but to be better at growing their capacity to meet the challenges of the future generation? When I was down there in South Africa, I started my talk by asking everyone in this audience of about 400 people to stand up if they were responsible for the leadership development of the next generation of leaders in South Africa. And when I asked that question, just about one third of the people stood up. And I said, no, I don't think you've heard the question. Please stand up if you have a responsibility for producing the next generation of leaders in South Africa and across Southern Africa, because there were people there from different South African, Southern African states. By that time, just over half stood up. And I then said, so why are people still sitting down? For in today's world, we are all responsible for creating the leadership of tomorrow. I, I had this pleasure of talking on a leadership conference where I was preceded by a Native American elder from a tribe in the middle of the Americas. And he said, in our tradition, a true leader is someone who, when they make a decision, is aware of the seven generations that come before them, the seven generations that come after them, and all living beings that share this moment in time with us. And I thought, wow, we're not even in the foothills of understanding the real challenge of stepping up to leadership, both for ourselves and for our clients. How do we produce the, the leadership of tomorrow that can really step up to the challenges of tomorrow rather than just be better at running the organizations of today? So I want to start by saying, you know, in 30 years, and I've probably been involved in coaching now, getting on for 40 years, and I've had the privilege of seeing this whole profession grow and spread all around the world. And we've achieved a great deal. Coaching is now the most popular form of leadership development. We've taken leadership development out of the classroom and personalized it and made it about real issues. Secondly, we've got great satisfaction ratings from those who are being coached. But be careful because as somebody said to me, one CEO cynically said to me, he said, well, who wouldn't be happy about somebody sitting there and listening to them for an hour? Thirdly, We've done a lot to shift the focus of leadership from being focused on IQ to being focused on EQ and relationship skills. We brought a whole emotional intelligence in, into the leadership development arena. 
But I want to suggest today that the next 30 years are not just a matter of moving from IQ to EQ, but from IQ to WeQ, or collective and collaborative intelligence. In the last 30 years, we've grown internal coaching communities with people inside organizations being trained in coaching. We've taught managers coaching skills. We've taken back the outsourced difficult conversations which people used to shunt off to be dealt with by coaches. And now we've taken them back to where they belong, where managers are developing coaching skills to coach their own people. We've grown, as, I, as Damien must have talked about in the previous talk, the expectations of all coaches having supervision, and supervision being not just for when you're in training, but a lifetime commitment to always be learning and developing your capacity as a coach. And finally, which I'll talk a bit about today, the growth in team coaching and in systemic team coaching. Because as one CEO said to me on the, on the research, he said, Peter, he said, I've got lots of coaches who coach my individual people. And I've got lots of consultants who consult to the parts of my organization, but that's not where my challenges lie. He said, all my challenges don't lie in the people or the parts, they lie in the connections. And what coaching still needs to develop is how do we coach the connections? The connections between people, the connections between teams and their stakeholders, between one team and another team, between organizations and their, and their partners. And how do we coach networks of organization and partnerships between organizations? And I would suggest to you that this is some of the future challenges that the coaching profession needs to quickly start to think about. For what's made us successful in the last 30 years is not what is needed for the next 30 years. To quote Marshall Goldsmith, what's got us to here won't get us to there. So how future fit are we as coaches? How future fit are we as a coaching profession? I am um, in 2000, late 2008, early 2009, I spoke at a coaching conference and said, what were the coaches doing while the, the banks were burning? This was the time when Lehman Brothers and RBS and Barclays and many other banks started to run into major problems and several of them went bust. And one of the things we know is that Lehman Brothers, the Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays, many others, had spent a lot of money on coaching. But that didn't stop them driving off the cliff. And when I asked that question, somebody put their hand up at the back and said, and I said, so what is it? And he said, it's obvious what the coaches were doing. I said, well, it's not obvious to me. What, what were they doing? And he said, the coaches were sending in their invoices quickly in order that they got paid before the bank went bust. And everyone laughed and I started to laugh and then I gulped. I thought, what an indictment of our profession. What are we doing to help organizations who are stuck in willful blindness? And so when we ask them what they want from coaching, they don't know how to ask for what they want. And what is our role in, in being the alarm clocks that wake our clients, their teams, the organizations up to the challenges of the future? One of my favorite formulas is this, that learning in organizations must equal or be greater than the speed that the environment is changing. And one of the things we know is that the environment on many, many levels is changing faster and in more complex ways than ever before. We used to talk about the future being that of a VUCA world, volatile, unpredictable, complex, and ambiguous. As one CEO said to me, We've been talking about this for 10 years. Now, today, I'm living it every day. So that if the world's changing faster and our environment is changing faster, then strategizing is something we have to do daily, not 
as it was when I was a manager and leader, something we did every five years. We used to take the strategy document off the shelf, blow the dust off it, change the figures and put it back. Today, strategizing is an ongoing event and process. But as Peter Drucker said, it's no good changing the strategy if you don't also change the culture because culture will always eat your strategy for breakfast. And we have another one liner that says, but leadership get the culture they collectively behave. So we have to think about not how do we change leadership one leader at a time, but how do we shift the collective leadership culture to shift the organizational culture, to deliver the strategy, to be responsive to the changing environment. And we, we have a challenge on that because we're taught in coaching training that we should leave our experience outside the door and we should just ask questions. But yet the feedback from senior clients, their biggest criticism of coaches is that they want to be challenged more. So part of the paradox is we have to be able to bring more challenge into the coaching room, but without knowing better or knowing first. But what I want to suggest to you is the challenge is already out there in the wider ecosystem, the business ecosystem, the organization. Our job is to make sure the challenges from the future and from the stakeholders are being brought into the room. That no longer can we have cozy, closeted, confidential, one-to-one -one conversations. We shouldn't just have two people in the coaching room. We should always have two people plus the client stakeholders metaphorically present. We shouldn't just ask the coach, what the, the, the coaching client, what do you want from coaching, but ask, who does your work serve? As I asked you at the beginning of this talk. And if we invited some of those people, some of your stakeholders into your room, what would they be telling you? Your current clients, your future clients, their organizations that they need your coaching to step up to. We should always be bringing the voice of the stakeholders into the room, giving them space in the coaching room because often they know more than we do the development we need. So I, I reduce strategy to, to, to one question, which I've used at the individual level, the team level, the organizational level. What can you uniquely do that the world of tomorrow needs? Not that your clients today ask for, but the world of tomorrow needs. And I've been asking that question for about ooh, 25 years. And eventually, when I got to about 60, somebody said to me, so Peter, what's your answer about what you could uniquely do? And I thought, well, that's a fair challenge. And I had to go off on retreat for, for at least three days to answer it. And at the end of the three days, I decided that these were the people keeping me working. And here's my memory test. This is Iris, Florence, Nancy, Charlie, and Freddie. They're my five grandchildren. And you might ask, well, why are they keeping me working? It's not because I'm subsidizing their parents' housing costs. Keeping me working is, if I live long enough, the one thing I can guarantee in the next 30 years is that those little people, if I go back to them, when they grow up, get through school, inshallah, they go to university, God willing, they become leaders out in the world, they will face far, far bigger challenges than my most privileged generation has had to face. And if, they, if I lived long enough and they came to me and said, what were you leaders and you coaches doing while you were creating this VUCA world? What were you doing in your greatly privileged world? And I probably lived in the most privileged generation that's ever lived in terms of opportunity, education, knowledge, at the click of a, a, a mouse, um, opportunities, health, the most privileged generation that's ever lived. What were we doing when we were leaving to our grandchildren a legacy of a world of greater demand, growing expectations, 
and diminishing resources. So let me say a bit about what came out of the research. The first thing that came out was these are the seven challenges. We, we interviewed CEOs from all around the world. We interviewed HR directors. We interviewed nominated millennial leaders of the future. And the first question we asked them is, what did they see as the major challenges their organizations were facing in the next five to 10 years? And I'll just pick up on a couple of them. And, and if you want to read the whole report, it's referenced down there, or just send me an email following this talk and I'll send you a PDF copy free. I'll just mention a couple. Number four, hollowing out of organizations and the growing complexity of the stakeholder world. Every organization we talked to right around the world said, in the next five to 10 years, we will employ less people. However, the number of stakeholders we will have to partner with will get bigger and more complex. That means, and I think most coaches and most leadership development have not woken up to the fact that leadership is moving away from leading my people, my team, my function, my organization, and it's much more about how do I connect horizontally across the organization, across all the stakeholder groups, because that stakeholder world is more complex, whereas the internal employees is getting smaller because of roboticization, artificial intelligence, digitalization, outsourcing. The other one I would just pick up is number three. I discovered a new verb that I didn't know existed called to be Uberized. And this is the fact that in any industry today, the competition is not going to come from people with a better product or even a better process. It's going to come from the people who will suddenly revolutionize our whole industry and its value chain. They, they will reorientate and reorchestrate it. So several CEOs who were in insurance said to me, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when Amazon enter insurance, our whole industry will be turned upside down overnight. And uh, so today, as a, as a leader, we probably, and as a profession of coaches, we have, uh, uh, a very difficult choice. Today's world, you're either disrupting yourself or you're waiting for someone else to disrupt you. And I think as a coaches and as a coaching profession, we need to step up to that challenge. Are we going to wait till we are disrupted or are we going to disrupt ourselves? And I think the latter is a better choice. So if we look at the challenge for today's leadership teams, these are some of them. How do they manage all these different conflicting expectations of different stakeholders? Secondly, as one CEO said to me, you know, today's work, he said, it's like I'm having to fly the aircraft of the organization at 40,000 feet and rebuild the airplane at the same time. And at the same time, I'm having to, to, to lead my team on the flight crew my team on the cabin crew and talk to the people at, at, at Grand Control and see what's coming over the horizon and look after the passengers in the back of the plane. That's what leadership is like today. Every leader is having to be a member of multiple teams. The team they lead, the team they're a member of, the board, project team, strategy teams. They're having to work with systemic conflict. Our investors want different things from our customers, who want different things from our suppliers, who want different things from the employees. And traditionally, we would give those to different people to look after. The HR director would look after the people, the, the, the finance director after the investors, the marketing manager or the sales manager after the customers, the supply chain manager over the suppliers. But today, we have to join up and find a way of getting synergy between all those different stakeholder needs. The challenges are in the connections, not in the parts. We cannot just manage the parts. I would suggest to you, if the only person who is integrating the different stakeholder needs 
and the different aspects of your organization is the CEO, that organization is not going to last very long. So we need teams not just looking after their parts, but collectively integrating the whole at every level in the organization. And we have to work virtually. In global, every organization, even if you're a small local village shop, your competition now is global. Your supply is global. Your investors may be global. Even if you're a local business, you're having to think globally. And I often pose this question to people. And I often meet some mathematicians who tell me the mathematical answer to, these, to this conundrum. But actually there is a team coaching answer. Often in a team of six, if we just count their heads, number one is correct. But in many senior teams, if we look at the productivity of the collective team, number two is correct. But number three is possible. If we then ask the question, how come we so often end up at number two? You know, I often talk about going to see leadership teams where the average IQ is over 120, but the leadership team functions at an IQ of somewhere around 60. And, and why is that? And that's because we understand more about the ones than we do about the pluses. And I want to suggest to you that just sending the individuals off for coaching individually will not shift the dial at the speed at which we need to. And that's just the people inside the team, right? If we looked at a team of seven people, there are over 94 different relationship combinations with inside that team. And I've yet to meet a, a, a senior leader who goes into a team of seven people and thinks, great, you know, normally they think I've got six people to manage because they don't notice themselves. I've got six people out there to sort out and manage. And that's what they bring to coaching. They don't think I've got 94 relationship combinations to orchestrate. They manage the individuals, not the connections. And that's just internally, externally. I was with a team recently, we, we looked at all their critical stakeholders. They had over 300 that that team had to manage. But not just 300 stake, critical stakeholders, you've also got to manage the connections between them because they talk to each other. And often leaders forget that. So we have to ask what can team coaching uniquely do that the world of tomorrow needs and how do we gear up for that? And I want to suggest today there are five areas where team coaching has to step up. Right. The first one I've started to talk about, we need to see the team, not the team leader as our client, not even the team as our client, but the team as our partner. And we need to see their stakeholders as our joint client. So we're not working as a supplier to the team, asking them what help they want. We're working with them as a partner asking them what does their organization, what do their customers, their employees need them as a team to step up to. We need to work developing a coaching culture, just which is very different than having lots of coaching happening. And I wrote a little book all about how do we create a coaching culture. We need to focus on human, what human relationships can do, what we can do as coaches, the e-coaching, and uh, the coaching bots can't do. Because now we know that there already are coaching apps that have a better range of the best coaching questions in the world. Coaching apps that can, can do empathy and can modulate the tone of their voice depending on the emotion of the person speaking to them. So we need to move on and find what we can do that AI can't. We need to coach the connections, not the parts, which I've talked a lot about, right? And we need, eventually, I'll end with this, we need to break down the, the barriers between coaching, leadership development, organizational development, HR, strategy. Because I want to suggest we're all part of a much bigger industry. 
And I've called that, and if you hear this in five years' time, remember you heard it here first. We all need to be part of one function, what I call the future fit function, because we all share one really important, challenging task. That is, how do we make individuals, teams, functions, organizations, partnerships, communities fit for the future, not just better at managing the pressures of today? So let me pause there. I've laid out what I think the challenges are. And after the break, I'll, um, I'll start to talk about how we address them. But Cindy, what questions have come in? Oh, unmute me. OK. Well, Peter, there's not many questions right now because you're so interesting to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like, I like the point you just made about future focus function. Yep. And I have a feeling you're going to go a bit later into some suggestions for future focus functions, right? Yep. So I won't ask the question then. Well, I, I, I just see, Cindy, oh. there's an interesting one that's come in from Rodrigo. Yeah. Um, sh shall I read that one out? Because it looks quite interesting. Yeah. I, vig I vigorously support and apply your higher call to work to the development of our future generations. However, it's difficult to compete against with Donald Trump and all the violence and hate in news and social media. I'm still an optimist human. W will uh, win over hate, racism, and bullying? Any practical suggestions for your audience? Mm. Great question. And, and the there's another one about, from, from Sridhar about how do we coach leaders who tend to be bullies and narcissists? Mm. Well, the, the first thing I think we've got to do is, as coaches, I developed this notion for supervisors and for coaches about how do we have wide-angled empathy? Because... Wide angle empathy is can we, when we're coaching someone, have as much empathy for everyone in their story and every, every system in their story as we do for them? One of the biggest traps that coaching has got into is um, a, a lot of coaches I sometimes refer to as organizational refugees. They love individual people, but they've fallen out of love with organizations. And very quickly then, we can get into my client I'm very empathic with, but we see them as victim, the organization is persecutor, and us as rescuer. So one of the things is how do we have wide-angled empathy for everyone in their story? But how do we locate the challenges, not in individuals, not even in Donald Trump, President Zuma or Nigel Farage in the England, but how do we always locate the challenges and, and, and the conflict in connections? Yeah. Because as soon as we do that, we avoid falling into taking sides and creating persecutors out there and victims in here and us as rescuer. And I've, I have said to coaches that I train, I say, look, you can practice wide-angled empathy when you watch the news. Watch the, the world news and see how many minutes you can go having empathy for every single person on the news, not just the victims, but, but the presidents who were re reacted to. My, my, uh, my record at the moment is I've never gone more than five and a half minutes without becoming reactive. But I think we need to train ourselves to get beyond the five and a half minutes. Well, I hope that's useful. And somebody has just posted. So thank you, Michael Cullen, for uh, posting uh, Drama Triangle reference that I've just done on, on, on the chat box, if anyone wants to find out where it is. So I think we have, a, we, we have to grow our empathic capacity. 
And that's true if we're also going to be team coaches. But let me just take it forward from there. Just talk about, well, what is team coaching and what is systemic team coaching? You see, for a long time, we used to do team coaching believing that the team was created by the individuals within it. And if we were working with a team, for, for 20 years, I used to go around and ask people, what do you want from team coaching? It took me 20 years to realize that that was a dumb question. So, you know, Sydney would tell me what was wrong with Magda and Magda would tell me what was wrong with Ram and all I would get was their interpersonal dynamics. It's not the individuals that create the team. The research shows us it's the purpose of the team that creates the team, not the individuals. If you want, you know, we used to believe if everyone understood each other's MBTI personality profile, and they had good relationships, we would have a high performing team. The research suggests that's not true. Good relationships help, but what makes the biggest difference is that the team has a collective purpose that they all recognize, and they recognize they can only achieve through collaboration, not through working in parallel. So that took us on to the second level, which I call system team coaching. This is where we see not the individuals, but the team as a living system as our client, where we look at, you know, helping the team have effective meetings, good generative dialogue rather than stuck debates, where we look at how they collaborate with each other. We help shift the team dynamic. However, that doesn't go far enough because we can have teams that have great meetings when they're together, but stop being a team the moment they leave the team meeting. I worked with a big government department that had a major transformation. They said, would I come and help them? This was about 15 years ago. And uh, I said, well, how do, you, how do you think I can most help you? They said, come and help us have better meetings. And I'd asked a dumb question. I went and sat in on their meetings. They had the best meetings I've ever seen. They, they started on time, finished on time. Every agenda item was 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 timed everyone was fully involved however that organization had a lot of conflict two levels beneath them why because the moment they left the team meeting they stopped being a member of the top leadership team and became the finance director the hr director the head of policy the head of pensions the head of employment and they stopped doing the integration so we need to realize that just coaching a team as though it exists within its own boundaries, is no longer fit for purpose, and move on to systemic team coaching, which I've written a lot about in, the, in, in my books. This is the team as existing to create value with and for all its stakeholders. Too much team coaching is, is trying to work out how do we tick the boxes to become a high performing team, and forgets that high performance does not exist inside the team it exists between the team and its stakeholders that a, a really effective team is one that is constantly growing the value they are creating with and for all their stakeholders so systemic team coaching also focuses on who the team is there to serve and also considers the future that the team needs to step up to it works future back and outside in it doesn't ask what you want from team coaching. It asks, who are all your stakeholders? Who are the stakeholders you're not noticing? What are they requiring you to step up to? What, what are you going to need to do in the future that you don't need to do today? I ask questions like, what are you going to regret in two years' time not having addressed while we're together today? What's going to come as a surprise to you in six months' time that you already half know? All sorts of questions that get the, the, the challenges from the future, the half-known challenges that we ignore, and the challenges from the stakeholders into the room, because that's the starting place for systemic team coaching. And then that's my definition. So systemic team coaching, 
too much team coaching around the world traditionally has been people invited in to facilitate off-site workshops. And uh, as part of writing the three editions of this book, I did a bit of research and asked, pe asked teams about how much, what percentage of the things they agreed on off-site workshops got translated into action back at work. And let me tell you, Cindy, and those listening, it was really depressing. <laughs> it was between naught and 30%. Yeah. And what do most coaches do? It's the same thing happens in individual work, individual coaching. Yeah. I, I supervise coaches all around the world and team coaches. And the biggest pattern that people bring to me in supervision is their frustration. They say, we had a great coaching session. There was an aha moment. They went away with an action plan. You know, I thought, great, we had a great coaching session. And I say, well, what's the problem? They say, they came back a month later and they hadn't done it. And do you know what most coaches do at that point? They blame the client. They say, oh, the client clearly lacked courage. They weren't committed. You know, they were self-seeking or whatever they blame them for. Rather than asking the question, what do we need to do different as coaches? And I say, no longer as coaches, can we believe we've done our job, but we just have moments, aha moments of insight and then good intentions. We have a phrase in English, which is the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So whether it's offsites or coaching sessions, we cannot any longer afford just to stop at the good intentions. They will not create the change necessary. That's why it's really important in our work on individual coaching, we've introduced the whole notion of once somebody's got their action plan, we then have to future pace it. We have to do fast forward rehearsals. Don't just, don't make your co commitments are made with our left, um, sorry, agreements are made with our left hemisphere neocortex. But commitments are always embodied. We make them with our body. We stand up and make commitments. So in coaching, we have to do fast forward rehearsals. Don't tell me about what you're gonna do, show me. Step into that meeting you're gonna have next Tuesday and, and demonstrate how you're gonna come into the room. What's your opening line? The same on offsites. We have to not just talk about how we're gonna change the team because if the change doesn't start in the room, it ain't gonna happen outside the room. So in, in my model of systemic team coaching, we talk about five disciplines that every team today has to have. Commissioning at the top right. That is, are we clear about why we're a team? Are we clear about not just what our bosses want us to do, but what our stakeholders want us to do? Our employees, our customers, our suppliers, our investors, our customers. And are we clear about what's, what's the, the, the challenge of tomorrow? that the world out there is asking us to step up to. You see, I've got, a, after you know, nearly 40 years of coaching and team development, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's not the coach that does the coaching. It's not even the client or the client team that does the coaching. It's not even the coach and the client that does the coaching. The coaching is done by life. Life is constantly providing a new curricula for us to step up to. The job of the coach is to get the team or the individual to wake up to how life is knocking on their door, asking them to step up to a bigger and greater future. So the step one in, 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 in systemic team coaching is, are we clear about why we're a team and what the world of tomorrow needs us to step up to? That's from the outside and the future, outside in, future back, then we come inside. We then have to take that and work out, well, what does that mean for us as a team? How do we work out what's our primary purpose that meets all our stakeholders' needs in an integrated way? How do we turn that into goals, clear roles? Who's gonna play on what part of the pitch? Team KPIs, our team charter. So if commissioning is about the why, clarifying is about the what. Then we have to come down to the co-creating. That's about the how. That's the traditional area that a lot of team development happened in. Our team dynamics, our team culture, 
our relationships? How do they need to shift in order to achieve the what to fulfill the why? But even if we do those three, we still haven't created any lasting value. We've just prepared the ground. We then have to move on to the, the connecting. Who are we there to serve and how do we transform the relationships with our engagement, with our employees, our customers, our communities, the more than human world of the ecology? How do we dynamically shift how we as a team are creating value with and for all those stakeholders? And finally, we can do all those four, but if we just do those four and not the fifth in the middle, we are becoming better at better at playing today's game, not growing our capacity to be successful in tomorrow's game. So core learning enters all four of those in terms of we're not just focusing on, on managing it as, as, as a today issue. We're growing our capacity as a team, week, month, quarter, year, to do more at higher quality with less resource and more successfully. So the team needs to be a learning team, the center of, of learning and growth, because if the team isn't doing that, even if we have everyone having individual coaching, it will not translate into stepping up to meet tomorrow's challenges. So that means, you know, some of you might think, well, I don't do team coaching, but you all need to learn team coaching because increasingly one of the most common things that individuals bring to individual coaching is please help me in how I lead my team. And in my book, I provide this model, which is how do we help team leaders move from being team manager who's running around trying to spin all the plates and manage all the individuals and is kind of bullying them. And somebody asked about bullying managers. Often people are bullies because they have not learned successful ways of expressing their needs. So actually with a bully, what we have to do is go back to what's the need that's appearing through a channel of bullying and help them learn other ways of expressing that need. And often it's the bullying manager who's rushing around trying to keep all the team, team plates spinning because they haven't learned how to lead in other ways. The, 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 the team leader is the person who steps back and says, no, my job is to look at what's the, the future and the big challenge. And how do I then move on to being team orchestrator where I get my team members to start connecting across the team and being mutually accountable? And finally, I have to move on to how to be a team coach. So I do encourage you to, to think about team coaching, even as an individual coach, because you are coaching individuals to team coach their teams. I'll, I'll skip that and just see. Any other questions that have come in, Cindy? Um, yeah, Peter, Peter, I have a question, uh, and then some of it is reflected in uh, somebody else's as well. Uh, one, of the one of the challenges that I've always found is uh, in, in whatever little that I do as team coaching is, as you said, while you are with them in the group, they seem to have a common agenda uh, that there is team purpose. But by the time they leave and they become the HR director, the finance director, and so on. So the question really is, do you have any suggestions on what we can do to coalesce those personal agendas into collective ones? Well, two, two, two answers, Ram. <clears throat> what, what is, I think if we start every coaching conversation and relationship, future back and outside in. So we start by not asking, Ram, what do you want from coaching? But tell me about yourself. Tell me about your work. Tell me who your work serves. Tell me what are those people wanting and needing you to step up to? And what, are they, what would they be saying is the work you and I need to do together? We will start to change the whole individualistic self-centeredness of, of Western thinking, which has infected the coaching profession. Yeah. And the same way we have to help leaders 
not not to manage the parts or, or come with solutions, but to how do they put the collective challenge on the table and then orchestrate the team to address the collective challenge and the connections, not just delegate, have delegated solutions to parts of it. I don't know if that starts to address your question, Ram. Well, it does. I completely agree with you. Uh, sorry, I started with no, with Marshall Goldsmith said he will find me $10 or $100 or whatever. But um, essentially, uh, the, the question really is, uh, you, you, you mentioned the most important point is the connecting part. Now, again, mm. uh, in that connecting part, uh, whatever one tries, collaboration, or all that, uh, there, there seems to be still something lacking, at least in the work that I do. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what is it uh, that can be done better. Right. Mm. Sorry, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just, somebody wanted me to go back to um, the previous slide so that they could see it. So I'm trying to listen to you and watch the, the messages coming in. Um, and I think it links to a couple of other questions that have come in, Ram, which is yeah. if the organizations say to you, well, you know, what we want is you to go and coach all our individuals. You say, well, that's a great opportunity. How do you switch them to be more systemic? Or if they ask you, will you come and run an away day or facilitate this process? How do you switch them to become more systemic? And, and, and part of that is, that I would always, I would, if somebody asked me to do it a wide day, I would never say yes or never say no. I'd always say, so what is the, the, the offsite workshop a solution to? What, what are you wanting that? What's the difference you want that to create? The same way as if they said, will you come and coach all our individual senior execs? I'd say, in order to do what? So that we do, we, no longer allow coaching to be selling a supply product. We're always partnering in the service of achieving an outcome. Yeah. And then, then often people say to me, well, I, you know, we, we, we want to do an offsite because we always do an offsite every year. I'd say, so what have you achieved out of the last offsite? So how do you want this one to be even more valuable? And as soon as we do that, we're moving towards a systemic response rather than a, individualistic self-centered response and it's that shift to collaborative intelligence and systemic thinking and being that's so urgently needed in organizations so i think hopefully that that uh, you know, people say to me how do you sell systemic team coaching because i've done it in i think 50 different countries now and the answer is i never do i just talk to senior leaders about what are the challenges coming over the horizon that they don't know how to step up to. And, and, and what's the price of, 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 of not stepping up to those challenges? And what's the, what's the upside if they do? And then I partner with them on how they can step up to what life is asking them to uh, respond to. Again, life is doing the coaching. I'm there to, to, to partner the people in how they respond to it. So does that kind of start to engage with a bit of that yes it does thanks a lot yeah great any other questions that have come in cindy that you think uh, i ought to try to address i think you've covered you know what you just said now you've covered aspects of the other co coaching questions or the questions that have come in coaches we've got our last few minutes left oh here there's one what is the difference between training team coaching and facilitating so, so, so facilitating is where you're brought in to facilitate a process, right? As soon as you get into that, that is a kind of, in my levels, that becomes before level one. Team coaching, you're helping a team achieve an outcome, not just responsible for the process. You're also responsible for shifting the performance. Systemic team coaching, you're there to, to grow the capacity of the team to meet the, not only its current challenges, but its future challenges. And, and as I keep saying, to, to the, 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 the capacity of the team to co-create value with and for all their stakeholders, including 
the ones they're not noticing. So let me, uh, just in, in closing, Cindy, just say that there is a fourth level. And, and in, the, uh, in my book, the, the third edition, this one, we go on, there's a whole new section, for those who've only read the first two editions, about ecosystemic team coaching. Because more and more what I'm realizing is that just coaching individual teams or coaching individual leaders is not, is not enough. Actually, it's the space between teams. So in ecosystemic team coaching, we're looking at how do we coach team of teams? Um, here, here's some examples. So one of the things I do a lot now with when people say, well, I coach their leadership team, I say, yes, I will, as long as I have access to the board and I can coach not just the board and the leadership team, but the relationship between them. And by the way, I also want to coach a shadow leadership team of young millennials drawn from right across the diverse aspects of your business and not just coach them in the leadership team and the board, but then, because I've learned the hard way, I used to do that and the, the shadow leadership team of young millennials would be invited into the boardroom to present their thinking. And the leaders would be very patronizing and say, thank you very much, great thinking, and no change would happen. Now I get them in the room together, the leadership team, the millennials, and I coach the space between them and I get them to coach each other. I say, look, I'm gonna score you, leadership team and millennials, on how many mindset shifts you create in the other team. And that changes the dynamic. I'm changing the space between them, not just coaching the teams. So hopefully that gives just a taste. Um, if you've not come across it, I do recommend General McChrystal's book on how he, he developed a whole team of teams approach to post-war Iraq. Gr a great read. Peter, we have one question from a coach who's waiting on the panel. Right. Um, Shalaz, ask a question. Thank you, Cindy. Peter, thank you. Fascinating work. Um, what are your non-negotiables when you take on a client um, in terms of what um, are critical to you for engaging the work? So, so if I'm taking on a team client, let's just stay with that. Um, first of all, I want, I want to know that they're a real team, not just a reporting group. So I want to know what they need to achieve together that they cannot achieve by working in parallel. Right, and if they haven't got a collective purpose, right, that then they're not a team. So I can't do team coaching. So even if they've got a purpose, I, I want to see that they have an appetite to step up to a bigger and wider calling to do more for the future. So if they just want me to come in and, and sort out their personal relationships and or, or have an off-site, which is um, what I describe edutainment. You know, a nice day away from the office where they can uh, have a nice barbecue, get on well together. I I'm not interested in doing that. I'm only interested in, is there some work to do that we can do together that they cannot do by themselves, which is going to create a bigger and better future? Mm. So it's the purpose, it's the purpose that decides the work not me or them. I'm not on my agenda or the client's agenda. I'm on life's agenda. There's a little article, by the way, I, I'm also willing to send people that I wrote for Coaching at Work called um, Cracking the Shell. Seven things they'll teach you on coach training that you have to unlearn in order to work systemically. And I, and I address some of those, <laughs> those sorts of questions that are coming up on the... Um, on the chat box. So let me just end with one last thing. I've talked about the future fit function. I think we have to realize that, that organizations today probably have more capacity to change the world for the better than most governments do. Because governments are constantly controlled by their electorate, by the press, by all sorts of pressures. And, and I do recommend you to go on and look at B teams beyond business as usual. How do we become part of helping organizations to realize 
the bigger impact they can have on the ecology, the communities, the way we operate as one global human family. And I think that's something that coaching needs to be part of. And I'm very proud to be part of the ethical coach. I'm very proud to be part of the ICF um, coaching action group that's doing work to create real change in many parts of the world. Because I think there's a lot of work to be done out there. But what the world needs is not just great coaches who coach individuals, but people who can create that change at the individual level, the team level, the organizational level, and the business ecosystem level. And that's what the world's crying out for. So I hope at least I've encouraged some of you to join this revolution with me. The revolution in coaching, for coaching to be future fit. Now that's my details. Lovely to join you. I want to say thank you not only for joining today, but thank you for the work that you're going to be doing over the next few years. And just remember that it's not just my grandchildren, but your grandchildren are depending on us to make those changes. It's been wonderful partnering with you, Peter. And the value you had is very thought-provoking. We need to all walk away and process future foot. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Coaches, it's been Bye, a donkey. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much. Magda? Lots of thank yous. Peter, this was amazing. As you can see in the chat, uh, very engaged audience. But um, I'm also so thank one other person. Uh, Michael Cullen has been amazing throughout the session, adding all the great links. So thank you to Michael as well for being an excellent attendee. Um, you can host everything next year. <laughs> But uh, Peter, thank you. This was wonderful. Um, if you don't mind sharing the slides, that would be great. Otherwise, I will take every single um, link that you mentioned and we will make sure that all our attendees get that on our blog later so they can continue to follow your work and learn from you as we have today. And do but join me on LinkedIn. That's great. We will. Um, thank you for this great capstone yeah. to a wonderful International Coaching Week. Uh, what a great high note to end on. Thanks for everyone who's been attending mm. throughout the week. We've had a blast and I know I've learned a ton. Um, I think all of you have as well, based on the comments I've seen. I hope to see all of you, including Peter, here next year for some uh, additional great sessions. Until then, we will say goodbye. Um, tomorrow, we'll get a summary email with all the goodies like videos and uh, claim forms. So please look out for that. And I hope to see all of you at future Cocharia coaching colloquiums, which happen every month. So beautiful sessions like this happen every single month. <laughs> Thank you so much and have a wonderful day, everyone. Go well. Hey, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.